this is cultish tendencies five and it will be focusing on similarities parallels between salafi publications the abu Khadijite cult and the cult of juhayman al utaybi who is well known for storming the harem in 1979 and holding thousands hostage for approximately two weeks now I thought it pertinent to draw these parallels because when I read through and reference some of the evidence, it will become unequivocally clear to the listener that there are indeed parallels, alarming parallels between the Abu Khadijah cult, Salafi publications, and that of al Juhayman al Utaybi's um, cult, which we will look at in detail. Some of this research relies upon a lecture given by Abu Amina Bilal Phillips in the UK in the early to mid 1990s, in which he gives an eyewitness account of what preceded the radicalization and behavioral extremism and then violent extremism of Juhayman and his followers, because Abu Amina actually knew this individual personally and has, as he recounts in his um, lecture he studied alongside him in his house on occasions as well suffice it to say that Abu Amina abandoned Juhayman um, before he proceeded along the extremist path that led him to besiege the harem mashallah to Allah. also when looking at this academic account of these two um, authors, in it contains empirical primary evidence from those who were with al Jahayman, and that includes our Sheikh Mukbil, Rahimahullah, who gives an account of some of what happened um, when he was with the group and he, of course, Alhamdulillah, and the other scholars who endorsed the group initially abandoned um, Juhayman as they saw the extremism beginning to develop in Medina. So I'm reading from very firm sources here. So we'll start with the initial opening of this paper, um, the story of Juhayman al Utaybi revisited. And quoting, it states, the storming of Mecca by Juhayman al Utaybi and his fellow rebels in November 1979 represents one of the most spectacular events in the modern history of Saudi Arabia. Yet, it is one of the least understood. Even decades after the event, many important questions remain unanswered. Who were the rebels and what did they want? Why and how did Juhayman's group come into existence? What happened with the rebels and their ideas after the Mecca events? And I thought it necessary to read this particular introduction because in parallel, we should ask who are the cult members from Maktaba Salafia, SP, the Abu Khadijites, and what is it they want? What is it that they have been seeking to make them grow in prominence? As I've mentioned in um, the night shift and in the previous recordings, we know that the leaders of the cult, in particular Abu Khadija, Amjad Rafiq, and one or two others, have their names on every document that refers to or relates to ownership, business, and the like. But then the foot soldiers, or those who are the lieutenants, lieutenants, sorry, Abu Hakim, Abu Junaid, these individuals, Hassan Somali, what is it that they got? What is it they wanted? And you'll see they have business interests, their own shops, um, real estate and the like. Then the next question that was asked in this introduction, why and how did Juhayman's group come into existence? Again, this was addressed in the night shift and previous audios that I've, um, I've expounded upon. And you'll see that um, they came into existence at a time when there was a gap and there was disarray among the Salafis in the UK with the collapse and the abandonment of Jimas, um, Abu Muntazir being at the helm at that time. There's also another question which I think 
brings us up to speed today. What happened with the rebels and their ideas after the Mecca events? We need to ask ourselves as well, because there is evidence of this taking place, what happened to those who have left this cult, the Abu Khadijites, Maktab al-Salafiyya, Salafi publications? What has happened to them? Now, we know some of them have come away and um, are speaking against them. But also there's another trait and trend that we must be aware of. And many of those who are aware of this cult will know that many, as we call it, have fallen off after the extremities of this cult and their ostracization of anyone who doesn't adhere to their particular way or follow their precepts. Once abandoning them and ostracizing them, some of these individuals have nowhere to go. They've, they've lived in a small, set, a small community, close-knit community, and everyone or a majority of their peers are with the cult. So leaving the cult means they become isolated. Some of them, unfortunately, did not have the strength um, and emotional intelligence to continue knowing that it's the deen they're upon and that they shouldn't be seeking, um, what is it, seeking support or seeking the approval of the cult. But sadly, they fell off, as we say. Continuing. As the paper says, a key problem has been the absence of good primary sources, which has made it virtually impossible for historians to trace the orig origin and history of Jehaman's movement in any significant detail. This changed in 2003, when Nasser al Husseini, a former associate of Juhayman, lifted the veil on his past and wrote a series of articles in the Saudi press about his experience as a member of Juhayman's group. al Husseini had been active in the organization between 1976 and 1978, but left a year before the Mecca operation. Similarly, when we listen to Abu Amina Bilal Phillips' account in that talk, um, Unity Upon What, he recounts a period of time when they were studying, when he was a student in Medina University and what was taking place in Medina and how they were leaving Medina to go out into the desert to sit and memorize hadith and, and worship more um, astutely and the like. He talks about that and the period when he decided to pull back. So these are very, very um, good sources, insider perspectives that can be relied upon and it's not secondhand information. So, moving on, when we move to page four, one thing that's very, very interesting on this particular um, paper that I'm referring to is the reference of the cult of Juhayman to leading scholars at the time and how the scholars at the time would engage and interact with them not seeing that extremism, but seeing that piety, that love for the sunnah, and, and them wanting to enjoy good and forbid evil in their society. So we see here the teachings, quoting, sorry, the teachings of the charismatic Al Albani were to have a strong impact on the Saudi religious scene, not le least because they formed the ideological basis for the pietistic organization from which Juhayman's rebels would emerge, namely, Al Jama'a, Al Salafiya, Al Mutasavi. And the English rendition for this, the Salafi group, which practices the commanding of right and forbidding of wrongdoing. So, this particular group took shape in Medina in the mid 1960s. And it was formed by a small group of religious students who, for some time, had been giving dawah in the city's poor neighborhoods. Now, coming back, we see that this cult today, the Abu Khadijites, they have a strong connection with one of our leading imams in his particular field of Jahwa Ta'deel, Sheikh Rabir al Madkali. So, what we see now is a parallel. Al Jahimin and that group attached themselves to a leading scholar in Sheikh al Albani. Rahimahullah. And we see today a parallel that this cult, SP, the Abu Khadijites, have attached themselves with Sheikh Rabir. Continuing, quote, 
Having been influenced by Al Albani, they were driven by a general conviction that the mainstream schools and tendencies in the Muslim world at the time, including the official Wahhabism of Saudi Arabia, needed to be purified of innovations and misperceptions. They were also acting to counter the growing influence of other groups on the religious scenes in the 1970s in Medina. So other religious groups, and they mentioned uh, Tablig Jama'a and the Muslim Brotherhood. But what you'll see is that this particular cult today, the Abu Khadijites, they have targeted other Salafis. They have left off the other groups of Bida. They've left them off completely. Okay, for example, when Riyadh al-Haq was in Birmingham, he was untouchable. Diabundi movement was growing. He's now moved to Leicester. We have witness accounts firsthand who told us that they were instructed not to refute Riyadh al-Haq or his following for fear of reprisals and then burning down their bookshop and things like this. So this is what we, we hear. Ahl al-Bidah were left alone, but they targeted the Salafis. That parallel is, is not exactly the same because we see that um, Juhayman's group actually targeted and went out and refuted Ikhwani Muslimin and Jamiat Tablik. No, not the Abu Khadijites. They target primarily the Salafis. They may do the token refutation of the Takfiris and the like, but their main focus is on fellow Salafis, who they then, as we know, label Qutbi, Sarori, everything else, Hadadi, this is all there, their writings are there. So, continuing. Both of their aims, that's promoting a purified Wahhabism, as this paper says, or Salafia, and providing an alternative to the exist existing forms of Islamic activism, were shared by some of the most prominent religious, religious scholars in Medina at the time, such as Sheikh Abdulaziz bin Baz and Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Jazari. The founding members of this group, JSM we're called them for now, Jahayman's group, developed personal contacts with these scholars and considered Sheikh Ibn Baz as their sheikh. The formation of JSM, Jamiat Salafia, was prompted by an episode known among the members of the, as the quote, breaking of the pictures, close quote, which occurred approximately around 1965. Now, it was uh, involved destroying pictures and photographs in public places. It caused friction um, and clashes in Medina between um, these, these individuals from the cult and local residents. Um, it drew the attention of many people. Now, having inflicted serious damage on commercial property, the perpetrators from this cult were arrested and imprisoned for about a week. This confrontation with the police inspired the main activists to intensify and coordinate their efforts. And it was at that time, not just not so long after, that they called themselves now simply Al Jama'a Al Salafiyya, the Salafi group. They approached Ibn Baz to ask for his approval. He greeted the initiative and suggested that they add the qualification al, um, a hispa, which referring to it as a hispa. And they did. They, they agreed with that addition from Sheikh Ibn Baz. Here, quote, Ibn Baz thus became the official spiritual guide of al Jamaa al Salafiyya and appointed Abu Bakr al Jazari as his deputy. So again, our Shayuk, Sheikh Ibn Baz, Sheikh Abu Bakr al Jazari, Sheikh Al Albani, may Allah have mercy on, on them, Rahimullah, and 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 Hafizullah for Sheikh uh, Abu Bakr al Jazari. What we see here is that these are our scholars. They are unsuspecting. They do not see anything but khair from this group, and the zeal of this group to revive the Sunnah and to adhere to the Sunnah and to enjoin the good and the, to forbid the evil. And this is why they readily endorsed and supported uh, this particular group. Similarly, and we have Husnul Dhan of our senior scholar, Sheikh Rabia, and the more junior ones with him, mashallah tabarakallah, that they only see a particular perspective of this cult. And seeing that particular face which they continually present 
to the Shiuki Medina today. Of course they're going to support them. They don't see the sinister cultism, the hisbia, the, 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 the venomous way that they attack fellow Salafis. And when they're attacked, as I've mentioned in my earlier audios, they say the Salafis are being attacked. They are attacking the Salafis, making these scholars think that it's non-Salafis who are attacking them, when in actuality, it's a body of Salafis around the world who will not subscribe to their cultism. Continuing with the paper. And we see a parallel again. The JSM, this cult of Juhaymin, encouraged its adherents to set up similar communities in other cities around the kingdom. I'll read again. The JSM encouraged, encouraged its adherents to set up similar communities in other cities around the kingdom. By 1976, the JSM had followers based in practically all major Saudi cities, including Mecca, Riyadh, Jeddah, Taif, Hail, Abha, Dammam, and Bureda. All branches had a local leader or contact person. Some branches, like the one in Mecca, were also based in purpose-built houses. Does this sound familiar, um, listeners? That we see that the Maktaba, the Abu Khadija, Salafi publications, they set up communities, they went and visited, and I know some of the individuals they visited because they told me they came and basically gave them a template. If they wanted to set up, they had to be a part of the Maktaba, they had to sell their, their audios, they had to buy their books, they couldn't do anything else than that, they had to invite their speakers down, and we see that that's proliferated and spread around the UK, I would say like a cancer, and the American colleagues will say likewise, and in the West Indies and elsewhere. So similar trend there with um, the, the JSM and the Maktaba cult uh, that, that has emanated from the UK. Now, when describing some of the characteristics of the um, cult members, and I'm going to go off a tangent quickly once I've mentioned this, but when we look at the um, positions they, they had in their professional or social sphere, this is how they were described by outside observers. Quote, they were therefore often described by outside observers at the time as unemployed, shop assistants or students. Close quote. This was their profession. Unemployed, shop assistants or students. Now, we're not saying anything's wrong with that, but again, when you look at some of the cult members in particular, they haven't proceeded beyond a particular level of study. They are unemployed and some of them unemployable. And some of them are students who studied in the Jamia and a significant number of them dropped out of the Jamia, a significant number of them, the most prominent being Abu Hakim Bilal Davis, who tried to get in a number of times and was kicked out a number of times. Going back to how the group established itself, you only have to compare its formation with that of Oasis in 1996, which then grew into Salafi publications. So that was the brief tangent that I said I was going to go on. I'm now going to refer back to the, the strand and thread that I've been um, expounding upon now. Continuing, quote, the JSM nevertheless held Al Albani in very high esteem and would organize teachings or lecture sessions with him whenever he came from Jordan to Mecca on pilgrimage. They also had links to the Pakistani Al Hadith through Sheikh Badiuddin Al Sindhi. A mountain of the scholar, mashallah, tabarakallah, rahimahullah, um, based, who was based in Mecca and was one of JSM's main religious references. Again, you're seeing, so what do the Maktaba do? The cult today from Birmingham. When they, whenever they travel out to Saudi Arabia, if they're coming on Hajj, as we know, they came recently and they bought an entourage of Diabundis, Sufis, um, which is amazing because of their disdain for Salafis and everyone else, apparently. But as I mentioned in my previous discourse, 
This is about business, so they will bring anyone, irrespective of ideological delineation, of, of school of thought, it's money for them. That's one of their key in, um, instances here. But they would visit, even when they bought some of the young, unsuspecting Salafis who joined them, they would visit Medina and go and visit some of the Shiuk there and really impress the Shiuk with the numbers. The sheikhs would come and do a lecture at a hotel that they were at and you'd have the wide-eyed young Salafis who were there and really impressed that a junior scholar would come and meet them or if they could speak to Sheikh, uh, sheikh Rabir and they would give this impression that they are the Salafis, that they have united the Salafis in the UK. So they would have sessions with their scholars in Medina and in Mecca, when Sheikh Rabia was in Mecca, they would um, visit Mecca in that instance as well. Similar to when Sheikh al Albani would come on pilgrimage from Jordan and they would arrange to have sessions with him. Now, while that was happening though, we see that concerns began to develop among some of the scholars from Medina. And one of the instances or incidents, should I say, that started causing this was when they started wearing sandals in the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid. They'd been doing that practice in some of the more remote um, masajid and Abu Amina Bilal Phillips account in the lecture that he gave in, 19, in the 1990s, attests to that. He was there with them, going and praying in the masajid that didn't have carpets and everything like that. But the fitna came when they started going into the Prophet Sallallahu Masjid with their shoes on, with their sandals on. And this, at this point, Abu Amina explains that when a sheikh came to speak to them about that, it's when he opened his eyes and saw that the path they were traversing was becoming more extreme. And it was at that point, the sandals in the, the masjid, Prophet Sallallahu masjid incident, that he pulled back. However, I'll quote from the paper again, the unorthodox practices of the JSM worried the scholars of Medina who had initially been sympathetic to the group. Sheikh Mukbil al-Wadi, one of the sheikhs of the JSM at the time, recalls being summoned by two senior Medina-based scholars, Sheikh Atiya Salim and Sheikh Umar Falata, who questioned him on 12 issues which they deemed problematic. The relations reached, the, sorry, the relations reached breaking point in the late summer of 1977, when a group of senior ulama led by Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Jazairi, Sheikh Ibn Baz had already left Medina at this point, visited what they their base which was called Beit al Ikhwan in the hope of convincing the members to relinquish their practices. They held a meeting on the roof during which Sheikh Al Jazairi clashed with the hardline Juhayman al Utaybi. The meeting ended with a split in the JSM. A minority, including most of the historical leaders of the group, declared their loyalty to Al Sheikh Al Jazairi and left Beit al Ikhwan, the, their base while a majority, comprising the youngest and most hot-headed members, rallied around Juhayman and insisted on continuing their work. Now, I'll move off again and bring a parallel. We only have to look at what has happened in East London, for example, and the, the, the dispute and the splitting that took place in East London. And the cult know full well what I'm referring to and those in London know full well that what I'm referring to and the split that took place and the fitna that was caused by the cult going to Sheikh Ubaid al-Jabri and getting something against the others who had split, they'd split away from and, and the like. And we know of splitting in America as well. And we know of splitting in the north of England in some of the towns in the north of England. And those who stay with the cult accuse the others of being Mumay, being unclear, being Qutubis, being the like. So this is key. This involves Sheikh Abu Bakr al Jazairi clashing with al Juhayman al Utaybi. Sheikh, Ab al Sheikh Abu Bakr, huge scholar. MashaAllah, Allah. Now, when you look at those two, let's look at some parallels that are more pertinent for us now. You look at Abu Khadija and the disrespect he shows to senior scholars like Sheikh Wasiullah Abbas. 
you see the cult's disrespect of a raft of scholars, as I've mentioned already, who disagree with them. Again, listeners, I'm drawing parallels between Jahayman al utaybi and his cult at that time and the cult that we're looking at today who are splitting the Salafis. Continuing, Sheikh Mu'bil al-Wadi recounts how he tried to mediate unsuccessfully between the two factions. Sheikh Mu'bil writes that Juhayman was being extremely distrustful and openly accused fellow members, including founding members of the group, such as Suleiman al-Shatwi, of being police informers. Draw parallels, not police informers, Kutubis, Ikwanis in disguise and sororis. That's what we hear instead of police informers. Police informers comes from the Takfiris. Continuing with the quote, after the rooftop episode, Jehaman was left as the only senior person and the natural leader of the smaller and radicalized JSM. From then on, Juhayman's name, Juhayman's name became synonymous with the organization and he and his followers would simply refer to themselves as the Ikwan. I'll read this part again so you understand why we refer now to this cult as the Abu Khadijites. Quote, from then on, Juhayman's name became synonymous with the organization and he and his followers would simply refer to themselves as the Ikwan. Okay. Let's talk more now about Juhayman. And excuse my pronunciation, I'm not Arab, as you know, and I don't speak Arabic. We're quote from the paper. Juhayman rose to prominence in the JSM primarily because of his charisma, age, and tribal pedigree. Abu Khadija, let's admit, has charisma. Most leaders of a cult or a group that's not a cult have charisma the ability to draw in individuals' attention, to lead individuals. But here is the key quote. It was particularly his readiness to openly criticize the ulama, which drew the admiration of the younger members of the organization. And I have to repeat this, listeners. It was particularly his readiness to openly criticize the ulama which drew the admiration of the younger members of the organization close quote you've already seen things that we've put out recently where he's written in his email in 2000 that's been quoted we wait for the lajna to correct its mistake the lajna consisting of kibar ulama however Contrast that with those who may not agree with a position of one of the scholars they refer to, Sheikh Rabir or Sheikh Muhammad Ibn Hadi. What is their stance to those who disagree with the scholars they refer to? Yet, Abu Khadija is seen as some hero because he can he challenges and refutes and disrespects and disparages alongside Abu Iyad, the milkshake among them. Scholars, muhaddiths, the muhaddith, Sheikh Wasila Abbas and others. There are a litany of scholars that they have disparaged. So Juhayman got his popularity because of his readiness to openly criticize the ulama. But let's see what happened as a result of that. Juhayman would come to dominate the group to the extent that According to al Huzaimi, who used to be with him, remember, who gives an eyewitness account, Juhayman's Ikhwan had many of the traits of a personality cult. The young members would compete for Juhayman's favour and were socially ranked according to their relationship with and proximity to the leader. Juhayman, in return, would punish those who dared to argue with him by ignoring them which would leave them socially excluded from the group. Earlier on in this, this discourse, I've spoken about those who did challenge the, the, this particular cult, Maktaba Salafiyya, the Abu Khadijites, 
those who would disagree with them and how they would be ostracized and marginalized and refuted. And it would even split in some instances uh, a man from his wife, a father from his daughter and the like, because they had fallen out of favor with the leader, Abu Khadija and his group. We refer to those who supported Juhayman very briefly now. And for example, Juhayman wasn't a prolific writer. Um, and we see here that while there were um, recordings of his ideas on cassette tapes and in pamphlets, none of the um, cassette recordings survived, but his pamphlet, pamphlets did. And they offered insights into his thinking. Now, while he wrote a little, again, I say he was not prolific because it says he was uncomfortable with writing. So he dictated his writings to his associates, Muhammad al Qatani, who would be the future Mahdi, who everyone was having dreams about. Um, you have to refer to Abu Amina Bilal Phillips' um, talk to hear about how everyone was dreaming about this, this individual, Muhammad al Qatani, who studied in Muhammad um, ibn Saud University in Riyadh. He was a third year student there and a very um, articulate orator who was very, very popular. But because he was speaking, um, indirectly against the government, they, he's, he's mass, he was stopped from speaking any longer in his local masjid, and then he was stopped from speaking completely in other masjid. But this cult, uh, Juhayman's cult, held him as a hero, and they invited him in, and he married um, Juhayman's um, sister um, to, to confirm um, this, this, um, this path that they had set for him, that he was actually the Mahdi, and he began to believe it himself. Once again, I say refer to Abu Amina's um, lecture uh, in the 90s for that. But Muhammad al Qatani was one of the scribes for Ajuhayman. Okay. And you'll see that Amjad Rafiq, Abu Iyad, is also the most prolific and one who writes most of the, the pieces for, for the cult, for the Abu Khadijites, for Salafi publications. So there again, yet another parallel. Okay. We see that. Up until a point, Sheikh Ibn Baz, Rahimullah, was still endorsing um, writings of uh, Sheikh, uh, of, sorry, of Juhayman. Okay, and we see the um, uh, letter that was distributed on the 31st of August 1978 was one that had um, an endorsement from Sheikh Ibn Baz. This is before he obviously saw the extremism and abandoned these individuals. Um, because of that distribution, that, that distribution um, it angered authorities in Saudi Arabia and um, they ordered the arrest of JSM members, Juhayman's members. And among the individuals targeted at that time in 78 was Sheikh Mokbil, who was accused of being one of the authors or the author. He was released three months after that and he wasn't an author, it was established. He was re released three months after being in prison in 78 and expelled to Yemen afterwards, where he resided up until close to his death when he returned to Saudi, rahimahullah. So, I will conclude now. I think that enough parallels have been drawn between the Abu Khadijites, Salafi publications, and Juhayman and his cult. And I will conclude with this particular paragraph from the paper, just as a reminder of the extremities that Juhayman had gone to. On the 20th of November 1979, the first day of the 15th century of the Islamic calendar, the Hijri calendar, a group of approximately 300 rebels led by Juhayman al utaybi stormed and seized control of the great mosque in Makkah, the holy, holiest place in Islam. Their aim was to have al Qatani consecrated as the Mahdi between the black stone of the Kaaba and the uh, station Muqam Ibrahim. al Muqam. they're saying here, I'm reading from them, the Muqam of Ibrahim, as tradition requires. Abu Amina refers to it being between the black stone and the Yemeni corner. So you'd have to refer to his um, lecture for that. The militants barricaded themselves in the compound within the harem, taking thousands of worshippers hostage, 
while awaiting the approach of a hostile army from the north, as promised by the uh, authentic hadith, the army coming from the north. The situation developed into a two-week siege, which left, which left an unknown number of people dead and exposed serious gaps in the security apparatus at that time. And the reason I refer to this particular conclusion, because Juhayman and his cult held pilgrims to hostage, held them as hostage in the harem. Very, very serious, serious crime. And no one would deny that. But they thought they were doing the right thing and they thought they had the Mahdi among them. This current cult, Maktaba Salafiyah, the Abu Khadijites, Salafi publications, they have held Salafis in various Western communities to hostage with their lies and their bullying and their browbeating of any Salafi that does not subscribe to their way. And they've continually lied to scholars and disparaged other scholars that have seen the reality of them and spoken against them. And this is very serious as a parallel because we see the last 20 years, the many communities that have been split. And we see sadly the cult members who blindly follow them and are speaking so highly of Abu Khadija um, beyond his station, beyond his, who he actually is and his reality believing that if you speak against Abu Khadija, you speak against the Sunnah. Allah Musta'an, A'udhu Billah. May Allah protect us from such gulu, such excessiveness in our opinion of normal lay people. So we will conclude with this parallel. It's a very, very serious parallel. And we hope that the scholars who support them today come to a realization, like our scholars Sheikh Ibn Baz, Rahimahullah, Sheikh Abu Bakr al-Jazairi, Sheikh Muqbil al-Wadi, and others of the scholars of Medina and Saudi Arabia, that they come to a realization like those mountains, those, those, those great scholars, and they abandon this cult in the same way that Juhayman and Utaybi's cult was abandoned before they spiraled into the evil that they committed in November 1979. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk.